So we're here visiting with Larry Wagner of the South Dakota Grassland Coalition. My name is Tans Herman. I'm the State Grazing Lands Soil Health Specialist with NRCS. And obviously top of mind for anybody in ag, particularly those that are pretty reliant on perennial forages, is, is the topic of drought and its impact, the cumulative impacts on forage production when not only last summer, but also last fall and last winter were dry. And thus far this spring, we really haven't even seen that much moisture, which is probably heavy on the minds of, of many in production ag with livestock on range. So Larry, I hope you'd be able to tell us a little bit of the background on, on your recognition of when, when a grazing plan and a contingency plan or drought plan became necessary for your operation. Well, it, it's, to me, it's always necessary because in, here in South Dakota, we're always real close to a drought, so you better have a plan all the time. And it's great when you don't have to use it, but that way, uh, when it becomes necessary, you you already got it, got your plan. It's mm -hmm. it's never too soon to ha have a plan. Yep. And and so, and I understand that you probably see your grazing plan and your drought plan as one and the same, but um, just the grazing plan component of it is that. Uh, what's that look like? Is it planned based on a normal year, and then you make adjustments up or down? Yeah, pretty much, yeah. yeah. Okay. Larry, I hope maybe you'd be able to talk through some of the either alternatives that, that you think through or discuss if you've got partners involved or, or actions maybe you've already taken as we're kind of heading into that second season of, of dry period. Uh, well, like last fall of, of calling cows already uh, because it's well, you could see last fall that we was going to have been have problems this spring because it was from the droughts from last year. It wasn't as severe as it is now, but it was starting, and, and you knew you was going to be short of grass. One of the things that I know the the NRCS we call it the South Dakota Drought Tool that can be downloaded on the NRCS website. Excuse me. One of the things that it uses as a forecast model for production is that previous fall's moisture. Up to 25% of this year's production can be tied to the months of August, September, October, you know, kind of <laughs> before freeze up because it all has that cumulative effect. The things I've noticed with grass just over the years, uh, your production has a lo lot to do with your fall moisture. And, you know, grass to me starts growing before we see it gr turning green. And if you don't have, if you're dry, then that grass just never comes in the spring. Like if, if the previous fall you had a lot of moisture and that moisture has to, to me is almost has to be there before the ground even thaws out or, or not thawed enough to take in moisture. And, and that's been my observation over years that the fall, fall moisture has so much to do with the next year's Grass crop. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. For sure, and especially some of those most important species like western wheatgrass, the state grass of South Dakota. Yeah, it yeah. sends out tillers in the fall. And yeah, and they need to get started. Yep, yep, and their, their productivity or even the number of those tillers that are starting new growth uh, is heavily dependent on that fall moisture. In ag, often we get to the point where we really identify with the things that we do. Whether we're a great farmer, we love our equipment. If we're a great rancher, we love our livestock. In most cases, that's that's beef cattle. Um, that can sometimes come at the expense of our natural resources um, because we put too much precedence with one thing or another. Um, Larry, I wondered if you could speak to the way you prioritize the resources at your disposal on the ranch. Well, the resources, uh, the soil health and the grass, which of course go together to get to have good soil health, to have good grass, that's got to be your first thing because you can't have livestock without 
something to eat. And, and that's why the resource, the, the grass resource, has to be your first priority to me. And, and it just goes to everything. I mean, so if you got the good grass, um, you got good wildlife, which enhances your grass, and, and that all goes together. And then when that is all good, then you can start adding your cattle to it. But you got to have that. That's the first priority. Sure. So, so if I'm hearing you correctly, the cattle are a tool to harvest the grass. That is a result of, of healthy functional soil. Right. Is it how? Yeah. That's what you use to to manage your grass and mm -hmm. use the cattle. Mm -hmm. And those same cattle that can be used as a tool to to benefit or enhance Good. the grass production can also be the tool that degrades it if we let them stay too long. Or take too it, it, yes, if we don't don't manage it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, the management gets to be a real important factor on that. I hope you'd explain to the viewers, Larry, just how you manage the ebb and flow of forage production from one year to the next with, your, with the livestock at your disposal. Well, by um, using yearlings, and, and I'm going to say two types of yearlings, the ones that are going to be sold, you sell them sooner, and then the other thing is by, uh, you know, like in a dry year, not keeping as many for replacement heifers, have cut back there will, and helps keep your core cow herd there. Sure, and, and I presume you probably call a little deeper. Well, you call call deeper on your on your cow herds and and you know older cows, any problem cows. And it's it's amazing how many of them cows get by when it's when you got plenty of grass, but when you don't, then well, she can go and she can go. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep, I love them a little less. Right now. Yeah, yeah. Because uh, yeah. if if somebody's got to go, you're the one that's gonna go. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. And and that can be any number of factors. Are there are there certain characteristics that you watch for as far as making those cold decisions? Well, it's just what I, um, I guess probably what I would breed for, uh, you know, disposition and uh, flushability and, and things like that. Just, just what will make you a good cow. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and if she's not, um, oh, ain't like fleshing or. And you just don't like the phenotype or something. It's it could be feet, could be eyes, could be bags and, and stuff that anything that's a problem. Um, you know, talking about that drought ain't all bad because uh, it cleans up a lot of herds and gets rid of a lot of problems with it. <laughs> that oh well, when we got plenty of grass, we'll keep her another year. Well, now it's well. Somebody's got to go, she's going to go. That, that, that you probably should have sold three years ago. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. That, you know, uh, Brett had mentioned it in, in our discussion is, is that uh, we can see this as a, as a crisis or we can see it as an opportunity. And, it, and what you're saying right there about drought can, cannot, isn't always a bad thing. Is that that's an opportunity to, to uh, make some strides in your genetic strains. Yep, mm -hmm. yep. I don't think it's, I think it's harder now to make decisions than it's ever been because we are in a world market and the way our, everything is being in a world market, what all goes on in the world anymore. And uh, right now things aren't good, Don't at least my thought, aren't, aren't good in the world. And so how do you make these decisions? And I guess the only thing I would say you just have to plan that they're going to come out right and just keep going forward you you you're never going to outguess it you're not going to be in the right but um, to me it's it's just another thing that's add to the difficulties of making decisions mm -hmm. it's, mm -hmm. and, and really probably boils down to uh, there are 
there's so much that you cannot control. Things that you can include the decisions that impact your herd, your land, your, your production cycle. Your livelihood and, yeah, yeah. It's, Quality of life for you and those that depend on you. That. Yeah, it's, it's a, we've had a, a real change in, that other generations have not had to deal with and so it's, it makes it a really a new thing to mm -hmm. work with. Yeah. But along that line, uh, of we're more techni technologically capable than we've ever been before. So if a person has a mind to research what, what has happened previously, whether it's markets or precipitation records or whatever, looking for those cycles and things, you can shelter yourself as best you can. You know, as best you can, yeah. and also uh, in times of, um, I guess I'll use the word crisis, I don't know if it's quite that bad, but um, if you're watching, there's, that always seems to make opportunity too. Certainly. Yeah, a lot of times it takes a crisis to make an opportunity, and you just got to be watching it and take advantage of that. Yep, look for the positive. Look for the positive, yeah. yeah. Okay, good advice. Larry, I think statewide there are folks that uh, are, are dependent on perennial forages and livestock for their living. And they're out of grass, they probably almost are already out of feed, and feel like their back's against the wall. And, and maybe they are in crisis mode. Um, what first steps would you suggest somebody that finds themselves there? Um, what, what should they do first? Or who should they reach out to? My first one they should reach out to is their banker. The financial thing. Uh, talk this situation over with your banker. Don't just go in and tell the banker, well, it was dry and I sold all the cows. Uh, talk to your banker. Maybe he can help you or, or somebody that uh, I guess like a mentor, uh, what your options are. Just don't, maybe you don't have to sell all the cows or sell part of them or, or whatever. And, and then all, as you're doing that, uh, it'll rain someday. And so then what do, how am I going to be positioned when the rain, my grass comes back and, and how am I going to handle that? What should I be doing to so I can get back in the cattle business. Right, right. And, and that, yeah. that, you know, let's just say for the one who does have to liquidate entirely for any number of reasons that might cause that, um, you know, maybe they don't have to own the livestock that grazes that grass, right? That is right. That would be, um, and I, like today, corn was over $8. Um, there's always going to be people looking for pasture to rent. And um, you can always rent your pasture out uh, and get started back in the cattle business that way. Mm -hmm. yep. And that'd be maybe worst case scenario, but for some that might be the first and best option if you're, um, you know, also working a job in town or what have you. There's any number of situations, and every operation is unique. Right. right every operation is different, uh, but that is. Uh, to me, the first thing you uh, want to talk to your bank or your financial person and, and also your accountant who does your taxes and see how this is all going to work out and, and things like that to, uh, to your best advantage of doing these things. So most ranchers kind of know what they're, what they're capable of producing in a normal year. I wondered if you might be able to express to us uh, how important planning the annual grazing rotation on, on the Wagner Ranch is, just because it's not the same every year, even though you know basically what the ranch is capable of. Right, it's, it's like right now, you know, it's a moisture thing. And there's other years, there's other things, but uh, my rotation is, you know, start really early on the brome grass because uh, I like brome grass. It, it, 
just makes like two crops out there. I mean, you, you hit that early, use that up, and then that gives you your warm seasons will come on really good. And it don't seem like it uses that much moisture to make much difference in that. And uh, I, anything, I guess, I like what you, I'm saying you're paying for it. Anything that's using water on your ranch and growing, you can harvest through cattle. At certain times, cattle eat everything. I mean, they eat your thistles, they'll eat anything. And so long as you have spent the money, I call it money, but actually water to grow that, uh, you better be harvesting it, get some good out of it. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned to me off camera that uh, you try to start most of the time in a different pasture each year, unless there's a specific objective. Maybe there's a lot of brome in a pasture and you maybe not necessarily change that season. Yeah, it, it, and I guess I found that, you know how brome grass is, you never have enough cattle. And so I, I try like two years in a row, hit it hard, and then probably the next year I'm off of it and hit a different pasture for a couple of years and kind of rotate that way to set the brome grass back as far as I can. And, and, you know, I mean, there's only, you can only take it back so far and then you start, when there ain't enough out there, then your livestock starts suffering, you know, you got enough feed. You bet. Yeah, you bet. there's yeah. a point there that... You and, and, and that it's not only the livestock, is that your soil might be uh, at risk for erosion or at least higher temperatures that has a negative impact on soil biology. You, you get the ground too bare, mm -hmm. yeah. Yep. Um, but uh, that's the balancing act. That's the art of uh, range management, right? Right. Is that it's not always the same and Smooth brome is a good example, is that we can use it for our benefit. It's here. We it, might as well use it for our benefit. Right. You're, like I said before, you've paid for growing it by using the water. Yeah. So, there, there's really something I've seen this winter that I, I've never, ever seen in, in pastures that was really not grazed down that much. But with being so dry and no snow... That grass got so brittle, and with our high winds, these pastures are getting bare and bare every day. The the it's just blowing off in, in these winds. I, I've never seen that. That you can visibly see these pastures getting bare as time goes on from just being so dry. I mean, no snow cover, nothing to keep keep that grass a little moist. It's just winds, these high winds, and so dry, it's got it so brittle, it just breaks off and blows away. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you're right, yeah, snow, especially a wet snow, would have pushed it down and got it in contact with the soil surface, yep. probably anchored it. An yeah, yeah. Would a little bit better than, than we saw this winter, at least. Right, yeah, it was never, there was nothing to get it down on the ground, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. Probably the, the best for the water thing is when we got real water, I mean, um, it don't make if it a drier year, it don't have to be as dry as this year, but if, if you're depending on dugout water and stuff like that, you know, we've seen, well, back before we had real water in our area and that, you know, there was, it was really hard to rotational graze anything because if you got a little drier year, well, that the dugout is dry or just about dry and there's no water there and so we got to keep doing the same pasture because that's the only water we got and things like that now with real water uh you just go to the pasture and it's it, you got water there it uh, has really made this rotational grazing really doable mm -hmm. for people and having good and good quality water that uh, uh, and other other counterparts with the Grassland Coalition have shared their strategies. Um, you know, if the water is low, maybe you can you can scrape or, or dig an access path so that that uh, the mud and bogging down isn't such an issue. Uh, Riley shared that uh, he's actually got a mobile pump unit that uh, he brings to 
to pump out of the water, um, pump out of the dam, and actually fenced out the livestock and put it into a tank so that the water quality is significantly better for not only the cows, but probably almost more importantly, the calves. Right. Uh, years ago, they did a, a study in, North, in Canada. And they had 300 cows. It was, I don't know how big the pasture, but it was just a one the hill 300 cows and had one dugout in it they fenced the fenced it in half right over the duck and part of the cows drank out of the dugout the other part of the cows they pumped the dugout so it was actually the same water and in the fall the calves were nine pounds heavier and i think the cows are like 35 pounds heavier you leave of course some a tank with real water in it. Cows were laying not too far away. And how many times that cow come and drank water, mm -hmm. lay down. And, and of course, it's the same thing with the calves and, and that is your cheapest gain there is, is water. Mm -hmm. um, in my career, I've, I've worked with some ranches where rural water was not an available option and they ended up drilling a, a deep well I mean, significant expense. Now there was some program assistance that helped offset a, a lot of the cost, but certainly not all of it. And, uh, and that particular, the one I'm thinking of in particular, kept track of for what the ranch had to pay out of pocket for the well, the pumping system. I think they installed seven miles of pipeline initially in, I'll just say a dozen tanks, somewhere about in there. It only took them seven years to fully recoup all the cost that they had out of pocket after the program assistance. Um, to, to recoup their costs on that entire water system, and it was solely attributed to the extra gain on those calves. The average over those seven years was 50 pounds heavier on the calves at weaning. Um, significant, and, and it was a situation where they were reliant on surface water up to that point, that it gets mucked up, the quality is lower, it takes energy to process through any of the, any of the pathogens and things that might be in the water. Um, and whether it's rural water or well water or even a clean surface water source that's pumped off site, it's just overall better for animal health. Right, yeah, and, and I would say the biggest part of that is just the consumption of water because it's easy. It, 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 they will go drink more and so then you have more gains and, and better health and it, yeah. Um, don't want to overlook our water. Yep. Yeah, it's